Hello and welcome back. Pseudo-coloring and colorization of a grayscale image are covered in this segment. The two topics closely related, since with both a black and white image is turned into a color image. The objectives, however, of the two problems differ. A number of objectives drive pseudo-coloring, such as to place normal objects in strange colors for attention, color a normal scene to match the color sensitivity of a human viewer, exploit contrast sensitivity, produce a natural color representation of a set of multispectral images of a scene, and enhance the visual quality of the image in general and reveal details and structure in it that were not visible before. Colorization of a black and white image, on the other hand, has as its objective, in most cases, the recovery of color that existed in the scene but was simply not captured by the sensor. It is a technique that was made popular in colorizing old black and white movies, which were filmed when color was not available. We will discuss some basic information on both pseudo-coloring and colorization approaches. We will describe a specific colorization example, that of colorizing a black and white photograph of a famous painting by Matisse, revealing valuable information about the process the famous master was applying in his work. Let us then proceed with this exciting topic. Some of the motivations, along with some examples of turning a grayscale image into a color image, are discussed next. Pseudo-coloring or false coloring is the enhancement technique of assigning color to grayscale values. It is done primarily for human visualization and interpretation of grayscale events. More specifically, some of the reasons are we might want to place objects in strange colors for attention, since humans will notice odd-colored objects more than others. We want to take advantage of the color sensitivity of the human viewer. The luminance response of rods and cones in the retina peaks in the green region of the visible spectrum, and we want to account for that. We want to exploit the contrast sensitivity of the eye to changes in the blue light. So we map normal colors of objects with fine details into shadows of blue. And we want to produce natural color representation of multispectral images of a scene. And some of these images may not even be obtained by sensors whose response is within the visible wavelength range, such as infrared and ultraviolet. I've also included here the colorization of black and white images and videos, although there in many cases the objective is to reproduce the true colors that were there in existence, although all we have available is a black and white image, by and large the colorization of black and white images and videos depends on uh, initial selection of colors and therefore it's uh, looked upon as an enhancement technique. So color is important because also humans by and large can discern thousands of color shades and intensities compared to only a few dozen or so of shades of gray. We show here the seven bands of a Landsat multispectral image. This image actually was shown earlier in the introduction of the, of the course. So this is the blue, green, red bands and the other four are infrared bands. This is actually Lancet image of the city of Amsterdam. Instead of looking at the bands one at a time, as shown here as a, as a, in a grayscale fashion, we can combine the bands and produce color images such as this one. These are actually from a different area. These are from the city of London. So combining the three visible bands, one obtains an image like this. The colors are kind of natural looking, the city shows here in gray, the water is blue and vegetation is in green. Combining the 432 bands, one, two, three are the visible ones, so there are two visible here and one infrared. One is able to better 
see the vegetation, infrared is reflected differently, and here's a combination of two infrared and one visible band, and in this case this is suitable for geological agricultural uh, purposes. We see here a beautiful pseudo-color image of the Great Lakes area, taken by this uh, MODIS, which stands for Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectro Radiometer, aboard the NASA satellite, Aqua satellite. So this is uh, Lake Michigan, and Chicago is around here. Lake Superior is up here. Huron, this one, and so on. So, for this false color image, um, the combination of a short wave infrared, a near infrared, and the red channel were used. And with this pseudo coloring, uh, we were able to distinguish ice from snow and water from clouds. We see that Lake Superior up here is completely frozen, and this was. Uh, taken in the recent winter of 2014. We describe here some of our own work on colorization. This is a digital picture of the masterpiece by Matisse, Bathers by a River, which is owned by the Art Institute of Chicago. This is an impressive painting, which measures almost 4 by 2.6 meters. Matisse considered it to be one of the five most pivotal works of his career. He worked on it on and off for almost nine years. The exact periods are shown here. Sometime around the beginning of November 1913, Matisse arranged for the photographer and dealer by the name of Drouet to record the state of the painting. So the black and white photograph he took is shown here. The artist kept working on the painting after the photograph was taken for another four years so the photograph is very different from the current state of the painting. So the problem at hand is to reproduce the color information of the painting back in November of 1913, as if Druet was using a color camera. Or in other words, we want to colorize the grayscale image. Colorization techniques have been utilized for movies since the 1970s. However, the requirements for painting colorization are different since high accuracy and fidelity are needed and the image formation model differs significantly from the natural or cartoon type of images that were used primarily for colorization. In all colorization algorithms, some initial conditions are needed, pixels for which the color is known and then this color is propagated to the rest of the pixels in the image. These initial conditions are typically referred to as scribbles. In finding these initial conditions for the um, problem at hand, we found the correlation between the intensity values of the Drouet picture and the intensity values of the painting in its current state. We show the maximum of these correlation values. So for this location shown here where the correlation is, is large, we can borrow the color from the current state of the painting to utilize to colorize the, the Drouet picture. In addition, microscopic holes were drilled into the painting, and here we see a cross-section of the painting at 200 times magnification. So, uh, it's, since, since Matisse was adding or scraping away painting while just working on this painting for nine years, it's not straightforward to identify which layer corresponds to which year. However, the curators were able to say, for example, in this case, this gray layer here belongs to the 1913, November 1913 period that um, the picture, the dread photograph was taken. So this additional information from this investigation, this forensics here, was utilized as well to generate scribbles. And at the end, these are the scribbles we are going to use, we used in colorizing the Drouet photograph. So the basic principles of the algorithm we used to colorize the Drouet photograph are discussed here. So changes in color correspond to changes in intensity, and therefore based on that, if two 
pixels have similar intensity, they will be assigned similar color. We work in the YUV color space. We have the Y, of course, the intensity or the luminance, and we solve for the two chrominance components, U and V. So in solving for U, for example, we have the value of U at location R, as shown here. Then we consider a neighborhood, such as the red window shown here. And we are solving for the intensities in these neighboring locations. So we try to minimize this uh, squared error term, but the intensities are weighted by this factor, which is dependent on the difference in intensity. So if this pixel and this pixel have similar intensities, then this weight is going to be close to 1. If the intensities are dissimilar, then the w is going to be small. So by doing so, we form a system of equations, linear equations ax equals b, and um, solving that, we just propagate the color from the known scribbles to the rest of the pixels in the image. So finally, we see here the black and white photograph again, the rare photograph taken in November 1913. And here are the results of colorization of this photograph based on our algorithm that I just briefly described. The colorized result is smooth, has limited color bleeding, and is consistent with conservation and art history research. It reaffirms the historical accounts of how the painting appeared at that uh, time period. This work helps support research that has for the first time uncovered how Matisse began the work as a highly chromatic, more naturalistic scene, but it changed it to, ex to explore new artistic directions on one hand, while at the same time reflecting the graver national mood due to the First World War. Furthermore, the colorized version helped curators and art historians visualize the process by which Matisse composed and transformed this complex work to reach its final form, and also helped them to identify other works by the artist reflecting a similar process.